Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back to Real Estate Coaching Radio, and today I am flying solo. Julie is not feeling well, and this is a podcast we wanted to get started because this is really critical information that all of you have. What we're going to be focusing on over the next, I really don't know how how long it's going to take, might be three, might be four, might be five days. What we're really going to be focusing on is creating your master financial plan. We're going to be going through all the pieces and and the parts of not just Uh, essentially, you know, earning money. That's frankly, you'll find as we go through this, that's the easy part of all this, but the keeping and the reinvesting and then having that money uh, be reinvested in things that starts to produce passive income. That is what we're going to be focusing on. So stay tuned. I'm going to go through this. This is just an overview, but these are the notes. These are the thoughts. These are the things that Julie and I've coached other agents and brokers to do over the years. And this is actually the same path that we have followed. And we have found, especially when you're in an economic time like this, that we're so massively grateful that we followed our own plan, opposed to doing something that was more risky or something that was more, I don't know, short-term beneficial. So just know when you're listening to this presentation over the next week or so, that Julie and I are, are not going to tell you to do things that are trendy. We're not going to tell you things to do that are going to be overly risky. We are build wealth slowly, but make it so that it actually compounds. And we're going to you know, not really talk a lot about things that maybe some of you want to focus on. We're going to focus on the things that have proven over generations to be the most predictable, duplicatable ways of building long-term sustainable debt. Now, I'm going to start out by sharing with you a vision that you might want to have as your own. When Julie and I got into real estate, our first year in the business, as some of you guys know, we sold over 100 homes. And we sold between 100 and 200 homes every year after that for about 10 years. In that time frame, we were um, we had we're creating a somewhat of a, a uh, I, I, what nowadays it would be called uh, influence, right? We were on covers of real estate magazines. We start we wrote a little book that has long since been out of publish uh, called Zero to Ten Million in One Year. We we're doing some speaking and things like that. And then we started having agents ask to uh, shadow us. And then some of those agents started asking to uh, have us coach them. And that was really how we started in the coaching business. Um, So from that process, I'm not just Julie and I working on our master financial plan and helping others do the same thing, following the fundamental things that I'm going to hopefully help you guys to understand over the next week or so. I've seen repeatedly how this works. And it's not something that is so complicated or overly analytical. We're not going to ask you to believe in some sort of you know, almost cult-like thing like crypto, nothing like that. This is going to be focused on the things that have just proven over generations to not just help you build wealth, but actually keep wealth. The keeping wealth part, as I said a second ago, is actually the hardest part um, that most of you are going to experience. I'm going to start out with a simple fact. Did you know that most people who earn a million dollars do it for a total of one year? So most of the, you know, people that uh, millionaires or people that earn a million dollars who aren't really millionaires, as we'll be discussing in a second, but most of the people that earn a million dollars, they do it once. So most people do not have a consistently high level of income production. And uh, I think that's a good place to start because one of the tenets of long-term wealth building isn't necessarily having to earn a million dollars per year, but it is consistently working, consistently getting results, consistently doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. So as we go through this plan, we're going to assume a few things. We're going to assume you've created a a predictable and duplicatable real estate practice. That's point number one. Now, if you haven't, then obviously you need to seriously consider joining Premier Coaching. And guess what? Premier Coaching is free. Just text the word Premier to 47372. So if you've not yet uh, created a very predictable, duplicatable real, real estate business, if your income is up and down, if your you know, stress level is up and down, that's directly tied to your income, you know, surprise, surprise. Well, let's fix that problem first, because what we're going to need to do for you to start creating um, a consistent, really invest consistently, is for you to start earning net income consistently. And I'll, but I'll give you a little relief valve for all this. If you follow this plan, your life won't have to be transactional for the rest of your life. In other words, your 
financial security and your peace of mind is not going to have to be predicated or dependent on a transaction, a house closing. That is where I want to get you guys. I want to make it so you have money coming in passively. So if you wake up in the morning and you know what? You decide to go on a long walk in the woods and you decide to take no appointments. It's just going to be you and, you know, your tennis shoes. That's perfectly fine because you're going to have enough other money coming in from other sources. And here's the other beautiful part of this. You don't have to wait until you're old and gray to actually be financially free. You can create financial freedom, uh, probably most of you within realistically, so that you don't have to work anymore within 24 to 36 months. And why am I saying that? Why was I thinking about that? Because I was about to give you examples of people that have done it, which I'm going to probably later on today's show. So number one, you've created at this point, or at least on your way to creating, predictable and duplicatable real estate, uh, predictable real estate, uh, real estate practice. In other words, you are mastering the art and science of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Uh, point number two, and again, we're making these assumptions. Otherwise, you're not going to be quite ready to implement this plan. So number two is you know how to proactively generate real estate business leads without buying or you know, overly speculating on questionable sources. And here's the reason that we had that as point number two. Because if your whole business is built on land, you, like the, you guys hear me say this all the time on the podcast, right? Don't build a mansion on land you don't own. And that is simply a way of saying, if you're building your business on bought sources of business, if you're building your real estate practice, or you know this is true for any business nowadays, if you're building your business on land you don't own, if you're building your business that's dependent on other people providing you leads, you really don't have any control. You don't have a business. You're just, again, stuck in the transactional roundy round. But unfortunately, it's even worse than that because those people that own the land that you're building your mansion on can change the rules, and they often do. You know, they go out of business. They'll decide to raise the cost. The light lead quality will, you know, you guys know what's, if you're buying leads, uh, are any of you experiencing an increase in the quality of your leads, especially buyer leads? Or are you noticing that the quality of the leads is uh, going into the dumpster? And that is the reason, ultimately, if you want to have a predictable and duplicatable real estate business that results in predictable and duplicatable real estate profit, that you know, profit from those sales, you're going to have to learn how to be a proactive lead generator. Uh, point number three, and this is really important you understand this, your product of your real estate business, what you're ultimately producing is, yes, happy customers, sold homes, transactions, it's all those types of things. But ultimately, please wrap your mind around the product that you're producing from your real estate business is profit. Profit is the ultimate litmus test of how efficient you are at producing uh, income consistently and how efficient you are of helping people buy and sell real estate. Profit is is the ultimate way of knowing how, you know, frankly, good you actually are at what you think you're great at. It's not just lots and lots of sold transactions. You guys have heard Julie and I talk on this podcast numerous times, hundreds of times to this point, if not thousands, how it's easier to sell a lot of houses. It's easier to make a lot of money uh, than it is to make a big amount of profit because most people are not making business decisions when they're deciding where they're going to get their leads from primarily or when they're scaling out their teams or when they're being tempted to spend money on things that they, you know, that are overly speculative, the branding end of the equation. So if you are in a, you know, making a million dollars per year, it's not unusual when you have a team and you have a lot of expenses and you're buying leads. It's not unusual for an agent making a million dollars a year that has this team of, say, 10 agents for them to be making less than an agent with, say, one assistant who's making maybe two hundred dollars to $225,000 a year total. That is actually an interesting little, you know, mathematical, um, you know, spreadsheet type analysis that we've done hundreds of times. And a lot of times I'll get someone on the phone and I'll, you know, a team leader or a broker, and we'll show them what they're actually making net from the business that they have. They will be very proud, rightfully so, of the number of homes they're selling, the number of people they have in their team, let's say, the recognition they get. But they're not so proud when they actually are willing to admit what their net income is. And what they always do is then they always start saying, well, I write a lot of my personal things off. In other words, they know their business is not profitable. They don't know why it's not profitable. Um, and I'll answer their question to make them, you know, frankly realize that it's probably not their fault, why it's not more profitable. It's because the business model, the team business model that's so built on buying leads has evolved to the point where the, and at the same time, commissions have gone down. At the same time, commission, the cost of leads has gone up. What you're seeing is the profit that's from those big uh, teams, those big scaled up teams is decreasing. 
The big T model started in the 90s. Julie and I were part of the big T model's evolution starting in the 90s. And really, well, it really started in the late 80s, but it really took off in the 90s. And we were there in all those formidable years as people were building teams. The original reason that people were building teams was because they did not want to have to work as hard. They were willing to take less profit um, and they wanted to basically have, you know, basically buy their team, their time back. And a lot of you, you know, you are doing it for the same reasons. But what you're not realizing, especially going into these, you know, radically changing uh, economic times, is a lot of those expenses that you have from having the team, those expenses are still going to be there whether or not you're selling homes or not. So this is, again, if you're wanting to become rich from selling real estate, and rich is a simple definition. It's in our book, Harris Rules. We talk about this a lot. Rich is where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. That is where we're trying to get you guys. And I hopefully you're you at least you can at least emotionally wrap your mind around what it would feel like to actually wake up every morning and not have to work where your money was just coming in passively. That's the definition of rich. Rich is where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. So if you need $10,000 a month or $20,000 a month to have all your personal bills paid with lots of comfort and security and all the rest of it, once you accomplish that, by our definition, you are rich. Congratulations. You no longer have to work. Come on now. <laughs> You've done really well. But if you are focused on selling a lot of houses and you know, generating a lot of volume and all the rest of it, and you're willing to spend your own net profit, what should be your own, own um, net income uh, for the essentially the, the accolades and the ego of all those other things, you're never going to be rich because you're not going to have enough money left over. Now, when money's flowing and, and transactions are happening at a fast pace like they were in this past market, it's easy to rationalize that you're doing the right thing because, you know what, there's money flowing all the time. There's people saying how great you are. Your team members are happy. Everything's great. But when the market changes like what we're experiencing now and when you now are still having to pay those bills that, you know, and the buyer agents are, you know, they're basically like pissed off hungry baby birds who you have to constantly be feeding. Well, those expenses, as the cash flow starts to decrease, start to eat you alive. And again, we can talk about all this, but really the foundational principle, the founding principle of really building long-term sustainable net profit in your business is to be very careful what you're spending your money on. So just be very clear about that. The product from your business is actually profit. And your profit should be in the 50 to 60% range. Earn 10000 you should be keeping at least half. If you have one assistant, you're going to keep something like 75 to 80%. If your goal is profit, what if instead of building your business plan around how many units you're going to sell or what your volume is going to be, why don't you build your business around how much profit you're going to make? And that's what we teach you to do in Premier Coaching, by the way. That's really what the real estate treasure map is, the, the fill-in-the-blank business plan. It's showing you how to back, you know, uh, reverse engineer what the goal should be, which is having lots of profit. So, for example, if you need $20,000 a month to pay your personal bills um, and you want to have some money for savings and investing and the rest of it, we'll figure out what that is. That's what you do in the real estate treasure map when you join Premier Coaching. And then we figure out how many actual transactions you have to do to meet or exceed, you know, the stuff you have to pay for, the stuff you want to, uh, you know, the taxes and the cost of living, and then the stuff you want to pay for. That's the stuff that goes to investing and maybe buying a boat or things like that. You reverse engineer it, and then you do your actual business plan around real numbers, not just ego-based stuff because you want to sell more. You want to sell 100 houses or 500 houses because so-and-so did. Look, there's nothing wrong with chasing a big goal, but there is something wrong with chasing a big goal where at the end of the rainbow, there's no money left over, and you find yourself at a certain age in your life where you would have wished, hoped and prayed, that you would have been able to save more money and accumulate more wealth. The saving of the more money and the accumulating of the wealth, I said this now the third time, is actually the hardest thing to do because it's so easy to get sucked in to the ego vortex of spending money to make money just so you can basically brag about your numbers, especially in this industry. That's the unfortunate truth. Your product, listeners, is what? It's profit. Next point. I think this is point number four, I think. You understand that long-term sustainable success is the result of, oh boy, you've heard this before, of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Um, doing what you don't want to do, and if you write down a list of the things, if I were to ask all of you individually, Bob, what are the five things that no matter what you will not do for the sake of lead generation for your real estate practice, write those five things down or those three things. You should do that all right now, listeners. It's a very introspective 
<laughs> I mean, some of you, it'll be very comical response. Write down in your mind, right now, do it. I challenge you. What are the three things that you will not do in your business, no matter what, uh, to generate leads? And I'm not talking about in the, uh, you know, it, illegal or unethical or immoral things. I'm saying lead generation, right? So there's lead generation that's passive that would be like mailing postcards or social advertising or, you know, pay-per-click or those types of things. Emailing, that's passive. Or there's proactive, actually having a direct conversation with someone about buying and selling real estate. So what are the three things that you would never do or five things you'd never do in your real estate business to lead generate? I bet you, if you're actually doing this, if you are actually willing to set your ego aside and actually do this, because it is interesting that the things that you wrote down are also the very things that will result in you helping someone and putting money in your fat, uh, your pocket the quickest. Like how many of you said, I will never, ever, ever, ever call an unrepresented owner, AKA a for sale by owner. I bet it was a lot of you, right? How many of you would say, I'll never, ever call an expired listing, but think about those things. How many would you have said, I'll never call a notice of default, or I'll never have a conversation with somebody that could actually result in them saying no to me, right? You're a fearful of hearing the word no. You're fearful of rejection. All these types of emotional responses that come from me asking the, you know, the three to five things question. Well, those are the same things that many of you are now mentally or maybe even physically writing down in your heads and on, or on paper or whatever. Those are the very things that get you paid the quickest. Those are the very things that are not dependent on you buying business. Those are the very things that when you get good at them, will produce consistent income. And yes, you can delegate a lot of those things to team members, provided you're focusing on what matters most. What is your product of your business? Oh, you said it already. I know some of you just said it. That's correct. It is profit. Okay. So I want to remember, or remind all of you, and this is another thing that if you internalize this, it'll actually feel like a uh, sense of relief. I remember when Julie and I, we first uh, created this, this saying, right? And this was years and years ago. Because we had, we were not born to be rich. We are not born by, uh, you know, we're not trained to be successful business owners or none of those things. We had to learn how to do it. And I remember as we were working through all this um, as a couple and individually, I remember how many interesting little pieces of, uh, you know, helpful information had been put into our heads that were actually preventing us from accumulating wealth. For example, and I'm going to go through some questions, some mindset checklist here in a second, but uh, you know what? I won't, I won't uh, step on my own next points. But as I go through these questions, I'm going to ask you guys a bunch of questions. I want you to really ask yourself and be honest about what your answer is. Because if you, again, allow yourself to go through this, um, this, these filters through these questions, you will quickly discover that the reason that you are not accumulating more money isn't because you can't, isn't because you, you know, wouldn't like to. It's because you have some deeply rooted uh, thoughts in your head about rich people, about being rich. I did. And you know, it came from a lot of just bad information. So what it is in essence, it for me, and I have to always, you know, gut, gut check myself with it too, is it's always, it is old operating system, right? There are little fragments of old code that was, you know, left from my formidable years that I always have to be observant of that it's not polluting the new code. And, and unfortunately, the whole entire world is reinforcing you never being rich. The whole entire world, everybody you know, is they don't want you to change. They want you to be like them. If you are blessed to have one or two people in your life that don't think like that, you need to you know, basically be those people's best friends. You need to do whatever it takes to keep those people uh, super close to you because most of us, um, we're surrounded by people who are not like that. We're surrounded by people that will never be rich, never accumulate wealth, never be introspective about why they're not doing it, never be introspective about what their lives would be like if they were to actually do it. And even worse, if you decide that you're going to be rich where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money, they'll oftentimes work against your accomplishment of that goal. And this does include your friends and family members. Let me rephrase that, especially your friends and family members, because they don't want you to change. They don't want you to become something that makes them question their own identity. They, when you decide that you want to be something greater than, you know, fill in the blank, that then forces them to wonder why you're rejecting what they are. So if you're amongst a group of people, family members, a small brokerage or a medium-sized brokerage, and you walk into the office, you're fired up, you listen to this podcast, 
You're saying, you know, I am going to go to the next level. I'm going to, within the next 24 months or less, create enough passive income that I never have to work again. And then all the money I continue to work or I earn will then go to creation of more wealth, more passive income. If you decide to have that idea and then you actually follow the plan that you'll be learning over the next week or so, how many people in your life would reinforce that? Not just say, okay, Bob, that's a great idea. Go for it. But how many would actually reinforce it? How many would really truly uh, do things that will be helpful, uh, give you suggestions on how you could even move faster? Nobody, right? What most of them will do is they'll say little self-serving, you know, things like, you know what? I, I mean, I had this happen the other day personally on a call with a very top producing agent, great agent. And she was made a point of making it clear to me that she has enough money, making enough money that she's happy and she doesn't think her life will be any better with more money. Something like that, some derivative of what I just said, to which I listened and I let her, you know, I'm, I'm being respectful. And then I said something and I was intending to be uh, to shock her because oftentimes when people are so stuck in their thinking there, you have to have a real confrontational approach sometimes just to get people to wake up. My way of doing it is hopefully making people laugh, right? So here's what I said. I said, everything I want, you know, Julie and I know from having been very poor to being where we are now that everything gets better with uh, money. We want more money. We want because it increases the quality of lifestyle we have. It increases every the quality of everything. There's nothing that's not a thousand X better when you're rich than when you're poor. Nothing. Some of you are going to say, well, the more your money you have, the, you know, the less happy you are. That is bullshit. All those research studies that show the average person has at earning $75,000 a year has the same level of happiness as someone earning a million dollars a year. How can that possibly be true? But Tim, the person earning a million dollars a year has to work a hell of a lot more. Are you telling me that the person earning $75,000 a year isn't, doesn't have a set of worries and concerns that uh, they would love to get rid of if they had more money? Are you telling me that the person earning a million dollars a year isn't essentially experiencing a better quality of life? Are you telling me the person that's earning a million dollars a year, if they were listening to this podcast and learning how to uh, use that money then to you know, create a passive income, that they're not going to be more on a mission because they're not going to have a clearer path for fu in, into the future where they can actually have their money working for them. They no longer have to work for their money. But Tim, if, what if happened? Like, isn't your health the most important thing? Yes, it is. But if you're rich and you get sick, you don't think you're going to have a better experience than if you're poor and you get sick? I mean, guys, you all know intuitively that more money does improve every aspect of your life. It does make it so that when you find people or organizations that you want to contribute to, you can in a more profound way. If you want to have an impact on other people in a meaningful way, have a lot of money so that you can then donate that money or you can at least you know, steer that, uh, your donations towards the betterment of humanity. You can do that when you have a lot of money. You can't do that. And I'll even go as far as to say poor people are selfish. They are, and rich people are generous. I know that's going to get some nasty comments, but it's the truth, and I want you just to allow yourself to think about it. Why? Because in order for someone to be rich, they have to have sacrificed a hell of a lot because basically everybody who's rich, a millionaire, especially first-generation millionaires, they weren't given the money. They had to earn the money, okay? They were business owners. So in order for all of you guys to be rich, think about this. You're going to have to sell a lot of houses. You're going to have to help a lot of people solve a problem, which is the buying and selling of real estate. You're going to have to, in order to accomplish that, you're going to have to be really good and disciplined and focused on making it so that you are the person that those uh, potential buyers or sellers choose uh, when it comes to buying and selling real estate. You're going to have to sacrifice free time. You are. You're going to have to sacrifice doing what you want to do when you want to do it. You're going to have to sacrifice nights and weekends, when you're, especially when you're building momentum. You are going to have to sacrifice, but you're doing it. Yes, the side stream benefit is you're going to become rich, but the other, side, the other direct benefit is you're helping more people. You can't just say, I'm going to help more people, and then all of a sudden people are going to come beating a path to your door. You're going to have to become the person that those people want to use, which means you're going to have to be skilled. You're going to have to know what to say to solve problems. You're going to have to earn the right to be of service to other people. And the more people you help solve their problems, the more of everything you have in life. So there is a direct correlation, an undeniable, I should call it a law. That's not a law, but you know, bear with me here. There's an undeniable connection between the number of people that you help uh, accomplish their goals in their lives and the amount of 
your goals in your life you'll be able to accomplish. So if you are rationalizing living far below what your potential is, that's selfish because you're not out there helping people. I want just to internalize that. I'm going to use Glenn Sanford as an example. He's a billionaire. He founded eXp Realty, right? Now, how many agents is, has that guy been able to help? 84,000. How many of those agents, because they're able to leverage all the things he's created eXp, have had their lives marketably improve over the you know 15 years that eXp Realty has been in business? Thousands, if not tens of thousands. To me, that's incredibly motivational. So Glenn has earned the right to be a millionaire because he's helping tens of thousands, if not millions of agents. Now, here, put this into the mix. How many buyers and sellers are those agents helping? Millions. That's how many. So when you are asking yourself why you're not experiencing more of what you wanted to experience in your life, it's only, it's not because you're too old, you're too young, you're, you're not educated enough or overeducated or too pretty or too ugly. It's none of those things. It's just because you haven't helped enough people yet. Just internalize that. Think about it. Why is Tom Cruise going to make $100 million plus or probably like $300 million from the latest Top Gun? Because the movie's fun as hell to watch, right? Because it made a lot of people feel good. Because it was a great, you know, distraction from all the insanity that's life for, you know, two hours. It made you feel good. If you were my age, it made you feel like you were back in high school. All those types of emotional responses. So Tom Cruise earns, a, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from that one movie because of the positive effect he has on a lot of other people's lives. That's it, guys. It's not more complicated than that. Don't make it more complicated than that. Don't politicize. Uh, don't allow your brain to run to, well, in order for uh, rich people to be rich, they have to take from somebody else, all the rest of it. So we're going to go through this quiz. And we're going to, I went, I'm going to ask these questions. I wrote a lot of these down yesterday. So I might be tripping over my own words <laughs> as I write these down because I didn't really edit them. But let's go through this, okay? So I'm going to ask yourself, uh, ask yourself these questions. There's a lot of questions. There are, some of them are sort of overlapping, but I think after you've asked yourself these questions, a lot of you are going to have an amazing sigh of relief. Um, you know, the, it's called like an epiphany, right? An epiphany where all of a sudden it almost feel like a little spark or in some cases a big spark of energy goes off inside of you that you don't, that you've experienced before, but maybe it's been a long time. I'm very, very enthusiastic about topping up, talking about this topic. Um, it's the reason, frankly, I was okay doing this podcast today by myself because I love this topic because I remember when I was personally, when Julie and I, we've married 31 years here in three days, guys, we've been married 31 years on September 15th. Julie and I have been married 31 years. So in that 31 years, these are all the things that we had to work our way through so that we gave ourselves permission to become the people that were able to help a lot of people. And then we were able to essentially, and we're still doing it, right? Build this life that we so dearly appreciate and love, right? So ask these questions of yourself. Number one, what is your current belief about actually being rich? How do you define rich? I give you our definition. Maybe if you don't have a definition, you should use our definition. And what do you really think about rich people? Let's discover that together. Let's go through this. So what do you really think about being rich? Okay, first of all, are your, are your five closest friends rich? And don't say rich with love and rich with relationships and rich with this, that, the other thing. Let's keep it practical. Money. Do they have money? Do, are they actually financially rich where their money's working for them and they no longer have to work for their, uh, their money? Are your five closest friends rich? Well, that's a good place to start because if you're around a lot of other people that are essentially very, uh, they're always under the thumb of having to earn money, then chances are, if you decide you're going to be rich, you're going to have those uh, close friends or family members uh, cause you conflict. I personally, Julie, thankfully didn't. But when Julie and I were selling real estate, we started to become more successful. I personally experienced a lot of problems with friends and family members that were very uncomfortable with the fact that Julie and I were quickly ascending. They were very uncomfortable. I don't want to share any personal stories today, but it was heart-wrenching some of the experiences I had. I wanted them to be proud of us. I wanted them to, you know, celebrate with us. We wanted to celebrate with them, but we made them feel so profoundly insecure, evidently, that they would just shut us out of their lives. Now, here's the amazing thing. And some of you, if you're being honest with you, you're fearful of becoming rich because you don't want that experience. And I get it. It sucks. But here's what we experienced. 
a lot of those people circled back around in our lives. We didn't reject them. We didn't say, we don't want to hang out with you anymore because, you know, we're high, uh, hoi polloi now or whatever, whatever. None of that happened. We are like, we sold over 100 houses, and the next year we sold more, next year we sold more. Our signs were everywhere. Obviously, we were doing well. Uh, and then we started noticing that people started dropping out of our lives, and it hurt our feelings. Definitely did. So what we discovered and, is that over time, what a lot of those people were doing initially is they were rejecting us, but what they were really doing is they were learning from us. It wasn't our intention for them to, but they were. And a lot of those people came back into our lives, and then they were, and many times a lot of them got into real estate. They started investing in real estate. Some of them, which we frankly are very thankful for, apologized and then said, you guys were a bright light for us. And then when we saw Tim and Julie do it, you know, Tim and Julie are just normal people. We saw them do something that was way out of the ordinary for how we were raised, then we can do it too. And by the way, remember when I said poor people are selfish? When you're a rich person, you're doing something that's extraordinary. You do become, <laughs> whether you like it or not, you do become an influencer, and I don't mean it in this current trendy way, on other people's lives in a profound way. You give them permission for them to transcend their current uh, place. So again, what is your mindset about being rich? Well, just check in with your five closest friends. It is okay for you to find people in your life that are rich that you can model yourself after. And I get that. That's a luxury. If you have people in your life that you can model yourself after, that's going to be something that's going to be a bit of a shortcut. For the rest of us, and this is what Julie and I did, is we read a lot of books. Uh, we read, you know, we listened to a lot of things. We surrounded ourselves with thoughts that were from rich people, and then we started to internalize those thoughts. We allowed ourselves to question our beliefs and some of the you know mythology about rich people that we were led to believe as we were raised. I mean, Julie, uh, again, her parents didn't were very celebratory of our success, but they were both school teachers, and school teachers definitely are not going. And, and school teachers, frankly, back and when we were being raised, were not as political as they are now. They were always left leaning, but evidently now there's something completely different going on. I don't know. I don't pay attention to the news. As you guys know, Julie and I are definitely media free, but yeah, they were appreciative, but they didn't understand. They were not understanding why Julie didn't come to teach her and I just didn't get a job somewhere. It wasn't really in their way of thinking, but they were still supportive of us, which was, which was wonderful. But again, if we had our five closest friends who were people that were paycheck people who took the nights and weekends off, who had, you know, scheduled paid vacations and, and all the rest of it, and theirs constantly would be questioning our sanity for doing things that are going to require us to do, give, you know, be sacrificing so much. We're not going to get the reinforcement that we'd otherwise want to have. And so we didn't. And thankfully, we were able to, you know, backfill with a lot of uh, education, some self-education. Question two, are you consuming info constantly that will reinforce being rich is what I just said, or are you doing the exact opposite? Do you choose to watch the news or do you choose to read a book, listen to a podcast about wealth building? Do you choose things to reinforce the person you want to become or do you choose things to reinforce your consistent or your, your constant and consistent, I think, myths and, myths and myth beliefs about society, right? If you are watching any news channel, you are being brainwashed and you seriously need to step away from those news channels. Now, another question for you. Are you incredibly careful who you listen to about wealth building, you know, or did you buy crypto because your barber told you to do it, right? Are you very, very, very careful that you're only taking advice from somebody who's actually has a provable track record of having done it? It's truly, it's fascinating to me how there's so many um, younger people mostly who have become influencers talking about how to do something that they have never actually done before. It's interesting to me because the people that are listening to them don't ask for proof that they actually have done what they claim to have been doing. And I see this happening all the time with YouTube real estate coaches. I think that's fascinating. I think it's fascinating that there's something in the human spirit that makes people so trusting because the person talking to them is coming from a TV screen. Don't you guys get the kind of the insanity of that? So first line of defense, when deciding who you're going to model yourself after for any aspect of your life, like, you know, I'm not going to, for example, you know, I'm not going to go to a really overweight person that smokes and ask them health advice. I'm just not going to do it. I think you guys will agree. If I want to learn how to play a sport, which frankly I don't, but if I wanted to learn how to play tennis, 
I'm going to go to the person that I can find that has the most provable track record of not just playing tennis at a high level, but teaching other people to do it as well. It's one thing to do it at a high level. It's another thing to be able to prove that you've actually uh, taught other people to do it as well. All these things are very important. Next point. Do you believe, this is a big one. I certainly was raised to believe this. It's painful for me just to read this point, but it's so true. Do you believe that rich people were born rich, lucky, or somehow, uh, you know, lucked into it? Is that what you believe? Do you believe that's true? And uh, we shared on this podcast before, there's lots of statistics. There's this uh, great website, I think it's called WealthX, that tracks uh, all this information about, you know, there's all these fancy terms. There's, uh, you know, decamillionaires and all the rest of it. And they look for... Um, characteristics amongst all these millionaire classes, all these groups of people, people that have net worth of a million dollars, five million, 10 million, 25 million, and all the way up. And the thing that is consistent with all of them, guess what? Almost all of them are business owners. Almost all of them created their own wealth in the first generation. In other words, they did it themselves. And yet, and yet, how many of us are led to believe that rich people were born with it? Rich people you know, somehow inherited it. In other words, they didn't earn it they somehow cheated it and jumped to the front of the line. Why is it that those people want you to believe that's true? Remember I told you a second ago, nobody wants you to be rich. This is the painful part. I'm going to tell you, frankly, this is, this sucks, but it's true. Why is it that so many people want you to believe that rich people essentially are only rich because someone gave it to them? Why? Answer the question. Here's the answer. Because they don't want you to know that you can do it yourself because they want you to be dependent. They don't want you to know that you can do it yourself because they want you to be dependent, dependent on having a job, depend, depending on, you know, being a never question the system. They want you to be a cog, a gear. They want you never to be free. Ultimately, isn't that what you want to be free? Isn't that what, you know, essentially having your being rich is where your money works for you and you no longer work for your money. You know, I was on a, a call earlier today with somebody, a guy with the first name of James, and I was having a similar conversation with him. And he said something to me, which I thought was awesome. He said, Tim, I don't know what I would do with my time if I didn't have to basically worry constantly about real estate transactions. And I said to him, this is on a Zoom, and I said to him, James, I have a feeling you'd figure it out. He started to laugh because instantly he knew he would figure it out. Instantly, for a second, that laugh, that emotional response from him, what that really was, was him feeling a little bit of how he would feel if he were actually financially free. You guys get it? Please allow yourself to feel that as well. Do go back to what I said before. Nobody wants you to be rich because that makes it so that you are the crab that's trying to get out of the bucket. Oh, you don't, you haven't heard that one? Okay, I'll tell you. And Julie and I have actually seen this. We are actually visiting our friend Penny McLaughlin and it was on Bainbridge Island off uh, Washington State's coast. Beautiful place. So we were looking at crabs in a bucket and there was one crab that was trying to get out of the bucket. It wasn't a big bucket. I even remember the color of the bucket. It was white. And there was one crab, it was, the crabs were about the size of my hand, that was trying to get out of the bucket, and all the other crabs were pulling the crab back in. Now, I'm not saying those crabs were thinking about mindset issues and, you know, why do you think you're better than us and you shouldn't be free if we can't be free? I don't think any of that was going on, but it's an interesting visualization, isn't it? How many of you have tried to get out of the bucket and you've been pulled back in? You weren't allowed to be free. You didn't allow yourselves to be free. And the people that were pulling you back in were the very people that should have been boosting you up. That's the hard part of being rich. That's been the thing that I think if you were to come to terms with that and realize that that's a natural reaction that people are going to have, expect it. Don't be mad at them. Don't be any, don't have any misgivings about the reaction. Just accept it. It is what it is. Um, and then proceed regardless, because as I said to you a second ago, they will most likely follow. Do you believe, next question, do you believe that if you follow your passion, money will follow? Oh, yes. I know some of you believe that. A lot of you do. I know who you are, too. Most of you who believe that are younger than 40. You've been lied to. How about that? Following your passion, the money will follow. What if your, your passion is to pick your toes all day? Oh, that, Tim, you're just being a smart ass. Well, I am, but I'm also trying to make a point. Following your passion does not mean the money will follow. That's not true. It's a lie. Matter of fact, having, a, having your passion or having your, your, uh, you know, your career or how you're hoping to build wealth be something you're passionate about is the greatest way ever to stop being passionate about that thing. You will stop caring about the thing that you are passionate about as soon as you have to do it in order to make your house payment. 
And Julie, if she were here, she would have given an example. She played in professional orchestras. All when I met her when she was a kid, her whole entire you know free time, music, music, music. It was something she was passionate about. She was just crazy about her you know her classical music. She wanted to be an orchestra. She had all these you know, and she did. She was very successful in doing all that. But what happened is she got older. She started wising up, right? And then she started talking to people that were first chairs and all these well-known, you know, these very well-known famous orchestras. If you guys know classical music, you know, the biggest names. And she got to be friends with some of them. She took master classes with some of them. And she wanted to not just learn their musical technique, but she wanted to know what it was like to be them. Because she wanted to know, do I want to be like you in 10 or 20 years? You know, is this really a, not just a career path, but this is really who I want to be? And the answer was hell to the no. Because what she quickly realized, and some of them were very honest with her, you know, Ju because Julie was, you know, she was a kid. She was like, this is something I'm passionate about. I love it. And they said, well, if you want to keep that passion, here's the worst thing you can do is uh, follow my lead. And that was, not all of them said that, but a lot of them did. And I think that's an interesting thing. So you do not have to be passionate about real estate to be successful. You do not have to be passionate about anything to be successful. You just have to be good at solving other people's problems. The next question I have for you. All right. Next question is, do you believe that being happy is your ultimate goal? Is that what you believe? Do you believe that unless you're feeling happy that you can't do it? How many of you will only work and only get any kind of result in your business or personal life when you feel a certain way? In other words, you have to have some kind of emotional sort of con you know, energy flowing through your body. And then when that's happening in your mind and your spirit, you're able to work at a high level. In other words, you do not work when you do not feel happy. You only work when you feel uh, you know, that certain higher level of energy. And then you disassociate with whatever pursuit you have because it doesn't make you happy anymore. For those people who think that the pursuit of life is the pursuit of happiness, that is going to keep you broke. Because oftentimes when you're trying, I was working out today and I almost made myself sick. I was not happy. I promise you, I was not happy. But, and you will not be happy a lot of times. The ultimate way that you become the person that you want to be is be the person that is helping people solve their problems and doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. It does take personal self-sacrifice, which again, is not something that a lot of you are believing that you have to include in your life professionally. You believe, unfortunately, that unless you have passion for it, unless it makes you happy, unless it's very fulfilling, that you shouldn't be doing it. What happens as a result? You go from one endeavor to another to another. You don't give yourself enough time to be really great at any one thing. Matthew McConaughey said it beautifully, I thought. Here's a quote from him. He said, life is barely long enough to be good at any one thing. Be careful what you choose. I love that. And, and it's so important that you get that. It takes a long damn time to become really good at anything. You know, there's a 10,000 rule. There's all these other things. But just go with that. Long damn time to be good at any one, uh, anything. So if you're hopping from candlestick maker to flautist to realtor to hairdresser, I mean, we all know people like that, right? You know, how many of you right now have hopped from a million different things that you're listening and you're wondering why you've never been successful? Because you haven't given enough time. Because you haven't stayed in the pursuit of becoming the best version of you as a real estate salesperson. Because you stopped being, as soon as it started becoming something that felt hard because you had to do something you didn't want to do when you didn't want to do it at, and you didn't, so there was no level for you to do it at, you just quit. How many of you decide, well, I got into real estate. It's going to be my personal art project. I'm going to, you know, do a lot of branding and be an influencer. Everyone's going to see me as successful and then somehow magically I'm going to become successful. Life doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Next question. Do you believe that being famous will make you rich? Okay, that's a trick question because in some cases the answer is yes. There are a lot of people like, um, I forget his name, number one YouTuber, you guys will know who he is. Well, I'll use the Kardashians, for example. I know the Kardashians, Tim, are using them as an example because they're actually incredibly brilliant business people. That's why. Kim and I believe her sister, they're both actual real, honest to God, no BS billionaires because they've created products around being famous. So they started being famous and then they were able to monetize that by selling products around being famous. So yes, in those examples, being famous did make them rich, but you don't think it took a hell of a lot of work for them and time for them to become famous? I mean, the Kardashians have been on the radar for what, 20 years at this point? 
that's not an overnight success, <laughs> not in any measure. So the moral of the story is in real estate, and you have to choose. In life, by the way, you have to choose. Do you want to be famous or do you want to be rich? You can't choose both. Now, I just gave you an exception where you can, but just bear with me here. Most of us are not the Kardashians. Can we just agree to that? Right. So I'm removing an objection that some of you younger folks will throw at me when I say this because I've experienced it before. So if you have to choose, listeners, between being rich and being famous, which do you choose? You have to choose between being rich and being famous. You can't choose both. Here's what happens. And, you know, this is really fascinating if you internalize this. If you have, if you are of a certain age, put it in perspective what I'm saying, because, you know, again, presented this a billion times, and it's very fascinating how people are introspective about this. And then you see those little sparks go off in their eyes. In when you're younger, and let's call younger for the sake of conversation, less than 30. And I asked you, do you choose to be rich or be famous? You're going to say, uh, you're not going to say rich. You're going to say famous. You're going to, because there's something in the human psyche that's hardwired into all of us that when you're younger, you are in the pursuit of, you know, essentially wanting to prove yourself to the tribe. You're wanting to prove your value. You're wanting to get affirmations and confirmation that you're a valuable contributor. You're going to spend a lot of time working out. You're going to spend a lot of time on how you look. You're going to spend a lot of time on those types of things because you're trying to sort out where you are. But where does that come from? Because in, their tw in the 20s, in, in the evolution of man, that's when a lot of people are, you know, finding their spouses and finding and mating and making children. So that's during the time, call it the peacock age, right? So during that time, that's what a lot of goes on. And it's a normal, natural part of people in their 20s to want to be famous. In other words, nowadays with social media, you can be famous. But that is what's happened. It's always happened. It always will happen. And it's just a normal, natural process. Now, if you're in your 20s and you're listening and you're wanting to skip ahead, and this is frankly what Julie and I did, you can acknowledge that that's a natural, innate part of who you are. And you can acknowledge that that is not something that's going to be sustainable. In other words, when you're in your 30s and older, you're not going to feel the need to get recognition from a, a lot of other people. You're not going to need the approval of strangers. You're going to want something different in your life. A suggestion would be skip the uh, a sort of the, uh, you know, the recognition phase of your 20s and go right to the next phase, which is that's when you start getting older, yes, you may be exercised, removed from your life, the desire to be famous and the desire for recognition. And now what you're looking for is something more profound. And as you get older, you're going to even have more of an attraction to really what matters the most to you. And for, every, for, for mankind, and that does include ladies, for mankind, there's three real tenets or three real things that matters the most to everyone. And here's what they are. Ready? Number one, you want someone to love or, and ideally somebody to love you. If you have somebody to love or somebody to love you, more the better, right, family, then you're going to be, generally speaking, you're going to be a happier person. Number two, you want to be doing something in your life that gives you a sense of purpose. You want to be doing something in your life that makes you feel a valuable contributor to society. Number three, you want to have something to look forward to. You want to have something, it could, look, it could be obviously the things that popped your mind first, but it also could be the knowing that doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do at the highest level over a long period of time can create a totally different trajectory for you and your family. But it's just three things, guys. Those are the three things that make people the happiest. It's having somebody to love and them to love and be loved, ideally. Number two, do something that gives them a sense of value, a sense of like, I'm contributing I'm being valued. I'm being appreciated. In other words, you are the best version of yourself as a real estate practitioner, and you feel good knowing you can help people. That you cannot shortcut. And number three, something to look forward to. When you gear your mind towards that, and your mind will be geared towards those things prominently as you age. Skip the self-flagellation you know, uh, era that most of us put ourselves through in our 20s and go right to the acceptance that you do have to choose, being rich or being famous. Choose to be rich. Because what's that going to do? That's going to put you in a state of being, uh, wanting to become the best version of yourself, again, as a real estate practitioner. It's going to put yourself in a state where you are going to learn how to be of service to other people. You're going to become a more valuable contributor to society. You're going to become the best version of you professionally um, and obviously uh, personally. I hope all of you, this is resonating. Some of you I know are, you know, this is coming out of left field save this information. Maybe it'll make more sense to you as you age. 
Um, but do realize that you will have to make a cho choice between being famous and being rich and in a very practical way. How many of you are spending money in your business right now just for recognition? How many of you right now are in pursuit of selling more houses or doing more volume just so you can make it on some list? How many of you right now in your real estate business are like sacrificing, uh, frankly, freedom, the potential, you know, being rich, basically freedom uh, in pursuit of, again, recognition, a plaque, a trophy, a name in a magazine, a name on a list, all those external ego things, recognition from strangers, the validation that you know what, you're okay. It's interesting, isn't it? And you guys notice how society wants you to be industry, our industry wants you to be in pursuit of the recognition. Do you remember about 49 minutes ago when I told you nobody wants you to be rich? Because once you're rich, you will no longer be suckered in to the pursuit of things that are not for your own betterment. Look, a plaque here and there, and a, that a boy or that a girl here and there, it feels good for sure, but what feels way better is being rich where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. If you have to choose and you cannot choose both, what are you going to choose? All right, so hopefully that is registered with all of you. Let me see if I have the energy to do one more. Well, okay, this is a good way to uh, round the bend on this one. All right, and we'll go to the rest of these questions tomorrow. All right, do you believe that whatever you want in life is on the other side of years of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level? Do you believe that? Now, it makes sense, right? If you want to become a famous musician or uh, if you want to become a, a great author or a great real estate agent or, you know, anything, it's going to take a long time. You can't shortcut it. But do you actually act like you believe it or do you quit too soon? Do you believe in things like overnight successes? Do you believe in, well, I will tell you guys a funny story. So Julie and I are out in California. <laughs> this is a funny story because I like to give you guys both sides of the coin. Give me a second here as I have a, another swallow of Celsius, my preferred source of caffeine. Hold on. All right, so Julie and I are out. By the way, it's proof that we don't edit our podcast. So Julie and I are out in Monterey for Car Week. And there's this rumor going around that there's this 24-year-old that's basically buying hundreds of cars. And I heard little bits and pieces. And the cars during Monterey Car Week, the average sale price at Monterey Car Week, I think per car, like was $700,000. So you're talking about really expensive cars. And it's not just like five of them. There's thousands of them. So there was this rumor going around that there was this 24-year-old that was buying up you know, cars like they were going out of fashion, which in some states I realize that they are, but that aside. Um, so then I was like, well, this sounds like a fun story to share with you guys on the podcast. Then I found out who it, who it was, and he was some 24-year-old guy that worked at Target, if I understand correctly. That part I'm not 100% on, but he won the California Powerball. He won like $800 million. I think that was the exact amount. And yeah, he, so even if 50% went in taxes and whatnot, he still has $400 million. So damn right he was spending a lot of money on cars and wherever the hell he went to. But that's an exception, right? That's not how most of us, what most of us are going to experience. Most of us are going to have to earn our right to be financially free. We're going to have to earn our right to be financially free by earning the right to be of service to as many other people as we can. I have to earn the right for you guys to listen to this podcast by sacrificing a lot of time and energy. Fortunately, I have my caffeine to help me along with that, right? I have to earn the right for you guys to trust Julie and I enough that you'll join our coaching program. I can't just, as a stranger, you know, show up and say, join our coaching program. I have to earn the right to be your real estate coach. That's the reason that Julie and I always say, you know, it's our honor and pleasure to be your real estate coach. It's, you know, it is an honor. And it is our pleasure that you chose us. It is, it's, it, it is, a, we wouldn't do it for free for sure. But the reality of it is, is that we have to earn the right, not just once, not just because we have a good year, but for decades. And we have to prove it constantly. We have to make ourselves better all the time. We can't just create a coaching program, you know, 10 years ago and say, that's that. It has to get updated constantly because the world changes constantly. What you guys need to learn changes constantly. So every single day, we have to earn the right to basically be your real estate coaches. You have to do the same to be successful at anything. And guys, obviously, we're real estate agents. We're real estate coaches. We're real, this is what we do. But this is also true on your personal side. You have to earn the right for your spouse to find you attractive. You have to earn the right for your kids to frankly respect you. You have to earn the right to continue to be friends who you're friends with. 
You have to earn the right to be considered a valuable member of society. You have to earn that every single day. The word complacency people use a lot, and everyone knows what it means, but it's also not a real word because it's not a real thing. It's like a made-up word. It's like boogala boogala. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Compla- complacency can't exist. It's impossible because everything around us is constantly changing, right? Everything around you. I mean, I'm, you know, Julie and I are in our cabin. We don't have our studio. That's just the reason it sounds a little echoey occasionally because I'm doing it in a vaulted room, but around me is surrounded by wood. The wood around me that makes the bed frame and everything else, those things are changing constantly. Our bodies are changing constantly. The air is changing constantly. The earth is changing constantly. The cells in your body changing constantly. Everything around you that looks solid is actually changing constantly. Everything is going through its own process and that's the way life works. So saying you're going to be complacent by saying, I'm just, I'm good at, this is it, you know. And I see this happen a lot with people in their 40s. Frankly, you know, men and women, they get to the point where they don't necessarily say it, but they say, well, you know, they think it, right? The best year is behind me. I'm going to, you know, forget working out. I'm just going to allow myself to get fat. If I haven't, you know, bought the things or had the experiences. I've never, I've always wanted to go to Europe, but I've never gone. Nah, maybe I'm not going to. People start giving up too soon. People give up on their dreams, their hopes, their ambitions too soon. And as soon as they lock back in, you listen to this podcast, I'm doing my best to give you guys an epiphany. You have, if you're still alive, it's, it's a great day when you wake up and you're looking at the green side of the grass, right? That is the, that is the bar. That's the bar I suggest all of you guys accept. It's not when interest rates are a certain level. It's not when the stars are in a certain alignment. It's not when your dog, you know, whatever. It's when you wake up and you're looking at the green side of the grass. In other words, if you're not, you know, six feet under, that's a great freaking day. That's it. And here's another little thought for you. You only live once and you're dead a real long time unless you believe in Buddhism, (laughs) right? But you only live once and you're dead a real long time. So why not in this life make the most of this life? Why not decide to re-engage with whatever it was that you dreamt about when you were younger? (laughs) If you don't remember what you dreamt about when you were younger, hang around some younger people and see what they're dreaming about. Notice how, I'll tell you what you dreamt about. You dreamt about basically having a life full of friends, having a life full of freedom. What you wanted ultimately, most likely, was get to the point where you could remove from yourself fear, where you could remove from your, your life worry, where you could remove your, from your life having to do law, you know, doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. In other words, you wanted to get to the point in your life where you were free. The only way you can get to a point where you don't constantly have to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level is by doing long periods of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Listen, please, please listen to what I'm saying. It does take sacrifice. It's not easy. Oftentimes, it's going to feel painful. Oftentimes, it's going to, you know, you're not going to want to do it. you got to do it anyway. And if you do it consistently for a long period of time, everything and even more things you can possibly imagine are on the other side of that. Anyone who's actually transcended knows when I, I I use a spiritual term, forgive me, but anyone who's actually created sustainable wealth to the point where they are rich, where their money is working for them, and they no longer have to work for the money, here's what it's like, Okay. So when you're coming up, and it doesn't matter what your age you are, and don't, older people, don't start, you know, selling yourself a line of bullshit that it's too late for you, because that's not true. So when, matter of fact, I'll give you this, older people, you'll waste less time, right? You will have a different set of priorities. You are going to be more focused on doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level, because you know you don't necessarily have the luxury of reinventing yourself a million times as if you were in your 20s, right? True story. But here's what happens. Once you have, and remember where the point was, everything takes longer than you think it should, but once you have earned the right to be financially free, earned the right to be rich where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money, here's what happens. You can do what you want to do when you want to do it at whatever the hell level you want to do it at, but you have to earn the right to do that. You have to be free. Now, with that said, no matter how rich you guys allow yourselves to become, you will still have to have times where you have to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. But as you're creating that freedom, you have to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level for like, you know, a lot, like 50, 60% of your time. 
But once you have gotten to the other side of it, where money is coming in passively, then it's like, you know, 10% of the time, maybe not even that, maybe 1% of the time. There might be one person or one experience that you choose to, you know, not have, or that, but you still have to endure. But it, it becomes everything in life changes. The context of how you feel changes. How you relate to other people change. You know, it's fascinating. I've discovered this too. And, I've, and this has been reinforced in my life a million times. The wealthier somebody is, the easier they are to talk to, the easier they are to befriend, the easier they are to, frankly, sometimes get some you know, advice from, right? It's, and it's because they real, it's because they're experiencing what I just said. It's because they no longer feel the angstfulness of being beholden. They are financially free. That is a gift that they gave to themselves. I, frankly, I really, truly got, I, I beg you guys to do the same thing. And, and it's ultimately because you will feel so much happier. You'll feel so much more fulfilled. You'll be in so much more of ser, ser, What makes you feel better than helping other people? Nothing, right? Being of service to other people, helping other people, that makes you feel, remember the three things I was mentioning earlier that basically give everyone meaning of life in essence, right? When you are actually in the service of helping other people, doing something gives you a sense of purpose and you're doing it consistently, that does feel amazing. But what feels more amazing is when you've accumulated enough money that the money's now working for you, your investments and some other things we're going to talk about, when those things start to become self-fulfilling and creating their own momentum in themselves, then you start seeing that money comes in. Nobody just decides not to work anymore. What you then do is you start to feel even more alive because now you've decoded life. Now you're free. Now you can do what you don't want to do. You can do what you want to do when you want to do it at the highest level. And if you want to go out and make a profound difference in someone's life, if you want to go out and, you know, make a significant financial contribution to something, you can. You can start changing the world. But really what you've done in the pursuit of your own freedom is you've given other people a pathway to follow. And it's not just a couple people either. It's thousands. You've become something that you've always wanted to be. You want to know what being influential is? Being influential is the person you can be. You want to have a real significance as a human? I've just given you a, a suggested pathway forward. Take all this seriously, guys. So listen, uh, obviously went longer than normal. I told you this was one of my favorite topics. I truly do adore it because on the other side of accepting what I'm saying is true for, I'm sure all of you, it, level of acceptance is completely dependent on you. The next thing all of you are going to want to do is say, okay, Tim, I get it. I totally understand. A lot of the ways I've been thinking have been holding me back. Remember, we started with mindset. A lot of the thoughts I've been allowing to percolate in my mind for my entire life have been working against me ever being free. True, true story. Now, now you're willing to accept the fact that those, you know, that old operating system is no longer benefiting you. You set it aside and now you can actually decide, okay, in order for me to be rich, in order for me to be the person I want to be, I have to help other people. That's true. So how can you help the most people? You have to become the best version of you as a real estate professional. You have to learn to master the art and science of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Stop being so narcissistic and focusing on your own personal, am I happy? Am I sad? How do I feel? No, focus on you. Can I solve your problem? I'm trying to solve all your problems right now. I'm doing my best right now to try to solve a problem for you that hopefully you will then accept the gift as it's intended. And then from that, you will take something of that. Now, here's what's going to happen. If you do, if you lock it in, this is going to be the start of a conversation you're going to have with yourself. You're then going to start finding other things and people to reinforce what I just said. And then you now become the beacon in the, you know, the, the clouds, right? You're the, you're the lighthouse for other people. You are now not just bettering yourself, but you're bettering hundreds, maybe dozens at first and hundreds and thousands because you are in pursuit of you becoming the best version of yourself. You guys get it? That's how you do it. If you want to really truly have an amazing impact on life, on humanity, if you want to be somebody significant, become somebody who's earned the right to be significant. Start with the thoughts I just shared with you, all right? So we're going to pick up where we left off today, tomorrow. Hopefully, Julia will be back um, so you guys don't have to listen to me rant for an hour. <laughs> but in the meantime, let me know what you think about this topic. Leave us some comments, obviously. Share with us more of what you want. We are going to be getting into the particulars. We are going to be talking about financial structures. We are going to be talking about LLCs. We are going to be talking about trusts. We are going to be talking about sources of income. 
and all the rest of it. But really, all those conversations are just academic if you have existing software, a.k.a. thinking, that's going to prevent you from actually taking action on all those things. So start with these basic things. It's certainly, you know, 20 years, 25 years ago when Julie and I were working through this ourselves. We still work through it, right? You're never quite done. It made a huge impact on our lives. Hopefully, it'll have a human, huge impact on your life as well. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.